All righty, we are going to talk about another Bible character. Do our Sunday school lesson on this person. Tonight, or this morning, is Absalom. Absalom. And when I think about Absalom, there's one word that comes to my mind. I want to see what comes to your mind. Absalom is the son of David. Absalom is the one that uh, he had the really long hair, he caught in the tree. He used, usurped his father's authority, tried to take over his kingdom. You know, he killed his brother Amnon. Just give you a few details. Now, what's the one word you think of to describe Absalom? His hair. Uh, his hair was. I was reading. Uh, I was reading this week. His hair probably is about four pounds long. Four pounds heavy. So that's what the scripture is basically. So what do you think of? I don't know about characteristics because that's what we've been doing each week, looking at Bible characters and talking about negative characteristics of these ones. Like Eve was deceived. Cain had anger. And so uh, these are one, two. Um, Joseph's brothers were not repentant. I'm sorry? Jealousy. Jealousy, okay. Jealousy. I can see how you would say that. I don't think that's it, though. But I, I can see that. All right, someone else. Ms. Shard, are you hot? How are we doing on that? Is it hot in here or cold? How many are hot? How many are cold? How many are purple? It's hard to do. Sorry for sure. <laughs> Can't please everybody. <laughs> All right. Uh, so the word I think of uh, with Absalom is rebellious. Um, I think Absalom, perhaps more than any person in Scripture, he characters a lot of people that show rebellion. But I think... Absalom more than any other character in the Bible he characterizes rebellion. Now, we talk about rebellion. Let's first define that. What does rebellion mean? A rebel is one who opposes or resists or disobeys the person who is in authority. And a rebel is one who refuses to bow down before one who is in authority. These are actually uh, Webster Dictionary definitions. Uh, assuming, obviously, that the authority is legitimate. You know, I'm not really so much talking about political rebellion. So let's just set that aside. We're talking about individuals here. And he was an individual that was very rebellious. He was unwilling to obey authority that was in his life. He resisted. He opposed it. And we're going to see many occasions of this in his life. Now, before you turn, I know you're in 1 Samuel, but I want you to turn, if you can, to Ephesians. Let's just look here at the Word in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. A difficult word for us to uh, grasp. I think Ephesians 5 perhaps embodies it better than any. Um, teaching us this word of subjection or submission. When we use the word submission or subjection, we almost automatically think of it in regards to women or wives in a, in a marital relationship. That is proper and is right. The Bible commands that, that a wife is in subjection or submission to her husband. Now, subjection or submission is, is not, a, it's not exactly the same word as obedience. It's a military word. Literally, the Greek word was a military word that was, meant that you bow down to a higher rank. Yield yourself to a higher doesn't mean you don't have an opinion. doesn't mean that you don't have rights, if you will, but you in turn yield to the higher rank. And the higher rank clearly in the home is that of the, is that of the husband. A lot of people don't like that. They think it's archaic. They think it's, um, you know, they'll say this is 2020 or whatever they may say. Uh, that's, that was given to us by the very God who created you and created me and made you with your weaknesses and your lacking and your strengths and my weaknesses. The very God who orchestrated society and has a formula for happiness, he said, this is how it should operate. All the confusion, the unraveling that's taking place in our society right now is happening, you say, because of drugs, or because of, it's happening because we are going away from the Bible blueprint of how we should live our life. Amen. And so the Bible blueprint includes that, includes submission. But before us men get too excited, submission is the word that we likewise have to live by as well. And we've rehearsed this before, 
that a husband doesn't have the right to do what he wants to do, but he has the responsibility to do what God commands him to do. And so for you, for a lady, she needs to be careful who she picks the husband. And uh, because she may pick an idiot. I'm not being serious. I'm being serious about it. Pick, a, pick an absolute idiot. And uh, <clears throat> that uh, turn is egotistical and arrogant. It feels like the whole world revolves around him, suppresses his wife and his children. And there's a lot of cases and example of that. And I would be very, I'm very supportive of strong uh, men being strong. Men should be strong. They should be strong because God commands them. They should be strong because that's what God made us to be, to dominate. But in turn, a man should not, not be stronger than God. Or shall I say, behave as though he's stronger than God. Submission applies to me and supplies to you as well. Uh, so here we see in verse number 22, it's mentioned, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Verse number 24, therefore, as a church is subject, unto Christ, so let the wives be your own husbands and everything. Verse number 21, submitting yourselves one to another. This is just one passage of scriptures. We know Hebrews um, speaks of this as well. Romans chapter 13 speaks of this, the idea of subjecting or submitting yourself. And a person who is rebellious, that's the very heart of the issue. They, they in turn, do not want to be told what to do. They don't want to yield themselves. And we all laugh about the story of the man who says, the young man who says, his dad, I'm tired, sick and tired of you telling me what to do. I'm leaving home. I'm joining the military. And, um, you know, for, well, surprise. You know. Now, military perhaps is changing or has changed. You know, they can become a victim while they're in the military, maybe. And they can get rights there. Who knows? I don't, I don't have any experience with that. But nonetheless, there's no part in society, and certainly no part in the Christian's life, that both men and women, children especially, that they shouldn't be living out submission in some form or another. And I would even go as far as this. A man who won't leave his home is living in rebellion to God. He's rebelling against God. So you don't understand. God understands. That's what you're commanded to do. Amen. He said, but my wife, you're rebelling against God. He said, my wife wants to live. Submission is her job. It's not your job. And my wife and I had these discussions early in her marriage. If she wants to submit to me as her husband, that's between her and the Lord. Her spirituality will be based, measured. She'll be judged according to that. But I'm not going to, whether I lead my family, has no bearing on what she's going to follow. If she chooses to be rebellious, thank God she's not. If she were to choose to be rebellious, that doesn't give me a right to be rebellious. Rebellion is plain and simple when a person will not obey those authorities that have been placed in the life. This is a very strong, very strong admonition from all of the, the prophets that write that we in turn should know what God has said and we should obey what God has said. And we should do it. And Absalom, just like Saul was the man of flesh, we saw that last week, or actually the last uh, two, two different weeks, we saw different characteristics of Saul, how that he illustrated fleshliness, that there was nothing spiritual about him, no spiritual inclination at all. Absalom, to me, becomes the very character that really highlights or displays, if you will, uh, that of rebellion. God wants us to take our proper place under those who are in positions of authority. Remembering that the greatest authority of all is God himself. And I would even go farther to say that there is only one authority. And that's God. And though we know that God has, he's delegated authority to husbands of homes and fathers. He's delegated authority to governments. And God help our government. And God help them. You know, they, they, their judgment will be severe. And what they've allowed, legalizing abortion, just the murdering of children, the scripture clearly, clearly, clearly states, states that in turn, if a child was, if a woman was, was carrying a child, a man by an act of violence killed a child of a woman, that man suffered a death. Why? Because that child was a human life. 
And so our government has legalized that. Our, our government is totally responsible for all this confusion that's going on in our world with families and headship and followership and genderism and, and the perversions. They're, they're, he's totally, they have the authority that they in turn can help lead us out of it. Instead, they're confusing us. They're confusing us totally. We're in schools. We're not, we're not talking about reading, writing, and arithmetic. We're talking about whether or not Sally or Johnny can take a, a little pill to change their sex. What in the world? And our government is fighting for that right. Our government will pay. Now, they're using the authority they have, and they're misusing it. And they, in turn, will pay. You know, there's going to be a judgment seat for that. But our responsibility as citizens is to follow the authority God's placed in our life as long as that authority doesn't violate God's authority. And we're not getting right to today. We follow God and follow God only. Completely, shall I say, not only. So we studied life of, of Absalom, what you're going to see over and over and over again. He was just rebellious in every way. Now look back, if you will, to Samuel. Samuel, in fact, uh, I think I told you first Samuel. I meant to say second Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter number 3. Samuel, uh, D David had multiple wives. I'm not going to get into a discussion about that. God never, God never wanted that. And what happens in David's family is a result of a man having multiple wives and multiple children because of that. Right? But that's, that's a whole other lesson. We're not going to deal with that today. David had one wife, and this wife in turn had a child by the name of Amnon. He had another wife, and this wife had a child by the name of Absalom and Tamar. Apparently, Tamar and Absalom both were remarkable in beauty. Uh, Tamar was, you know, was the lust of Amnon. Amnon, the Bible says, was sick. He was physically sick because he lusted for his sister Tamar because she was so beautiful. Absalom was said about him that he had no physical blemishes at all. That he in turn was, was the perfect man in appearance. And so this was Absalom. And so Amnon was David's oldest child. Absalom, however, was a younger child. He would have been, I think, second or third in line, second in line. And so here in these first verses of chapter number three, in fact, let's read them just to get the, the history of it. Chapter three, are you there? Say amen. Look, if you will, in verse number 2, it says, And unto David were sons born in Hebron. The firstborn was Amnon of Ahinoam, the Jezreitess. And the second was Chileab of Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And the third, Absalom, the son of Maacah, the daughter of Talmaiah, king of Gershah. And the fourth was Adoniah. You can see I won't continue. So according to this list here, Absalom would have been the third in line, if you will, to be king. Now, I only mention that because Amnon uh, was half-sister, or was a half-brother to Tamar. Tamar was gorgeous. She was beautiful. They had the same father, different mothers. The scripture forbids this relationship. And yet he in turn desired, and as I mentioned a moment ago, he was sick of lust, of lust, because he desired her so strongly. And then Absalom, or Amnon, had a friend by the name of Jonadab, who was his cousin, who told him, gave him a plot, how that he could seduce his sister and rape her. And so he worked out this narrative. You know, he played as though he was sick. He requested for his sister Tamar to come in and make special cakes. Uh, that, you know, that he said, this will make me feel better. Once she was making the cakes, he sent everybody out and raped her. She begged and pleaded with him not to do it. She apparently, it seems as though she was a modest lady. She was a, she was a righteous lady. And she denied him. She begged of him. She then even asked him if she was going to do this, to go about it the right way. And that's the king. And she, she tried in every way to keep him from being, that he was, from being involved in the sin. And then after Amnon had this relationship with Tamar, the Bible says the love that he had for her was as the hate that he had for her. So now this man who loved her, now he hates her and he throws her out. And she in turn is hated, if you will, uh, because of this action. Now, surprisingly enough, according to the law of Moses, that was not a crime punishable by death. Now, as I mentioned last week and Sunday morning, that most all of the breakings of the law of Moses 
retribution was made financial. That's why the eye for an eye tooth for tooth were given as a standard so that you would evaluate, you know, the you know the the financial amount, if you will, that you would give. If that was satisfactory, then in turn it was accepted. That was a guide that the judge used. And so as far as death penalty, death penalty uh, that was not allowed, it was not allowed for someone to financially pay in the case of a murder. They, in turn, were required to die. If it was an accidental murder, then there were certain cities that were set up as cities of refuge where you could run to and stay, and law could not be executed for your crime in those cities. If, in turn, the leaders of that city were convinced that was an accidental death, and we have laws, our laws in some way are framed after these laws of Moses. And so, in this case, uh, Amnon, he didn't die. I, I don't even know that David really did anything with Amnon. I don't know anything that he did. He didn't shame him, did anything. But Amnon, you understand, Amnon is going to be the king of Israel. Amnon is David's firstborn son. Amnon is in the, he's in the lineage. He will be the one that takes over when David passes away. And Absalom is aware of that. And so Amnon then takes upon himself <clears throat> to uh, bring revenge upon his sister Tamar. And he organizes this big party, invites all of his stepbrothers and sisters. And then at a given time with a signal, he in turn has his brother killed. And then he flees from there and he goes back to Hebron. And there he stays uh, so that he in turn can escape away from any judgment upon himself. But what he actually did was that he took the law in his own hands. He brought revenge. And he did something more than what the law would require. And I believe, now it's left for discussion if you, you can think otherwise. I think he totally did this because he was trying to remove Amnon out of the way so that he could be the king. I think he totally did it because he wanted to be king. Because what you're going to find about Absalom's life is that Absalom never, he never let anybody tell him what to do. Whether it was his father David, or whether it was General Joab, or whether whomever, it didn't matter. Joab didn't listen to anybody. Joab, or, or, or Absalom, he didn't listen to anybody. Absalom, he did what he wanted to do, and that's what he did. And if it went in his favor, that was good. If it didn't go in his favor, then in turn he changed, he planned to change the playing scene. So then in turn, that it matched. Well, we find uh, 2 Samuel chapter 14 is advanced there. I've given you quite a bit of history about Absalom's life just there. We jump over a few chapters. Um, in chapter number 14, I mentioned that he went to Hebron. He didn't go to Hebron. He went to Gersher. And here in chapter 14, uh, verse number 21. And the king said unto Joab, Behold, now I have done this thing. Go therefore bring the young man Absalom again. And so he's, he's, he ran because of his crime with Abnon. Now listen. He should die for what he did. He took his brother's life for a crime the scripture doesn't pronounce, you know, the death penalty. And now David, and David doesn't enact the death penalty upon him. He should have died. And he stays there long enough until it blows over, long enough until the emotions have died out, and long enough until, uh, you know, everybody uh, had somewhat, um, you know, become desensitized to his actions. And then Joab, by way of the, by Joab and Absalom conspire, and a story is told, and David in turn says, okay, I get it, I'll let Absalom come back. And Absalom comes back and lives there in Jerusalem. Verse number 24 of the same chapter. And the king said, Let him turn to his own house and let him not see my face. So Absalom returned to his own house and saw not the king's face. So he's living there in Jerusalem, but the king is not going to see him. The king doesn't want to see him. And uh, I don't know why. That's just conjecture on this point. A part maybe it's because Absalom reminds David of his own day. And that's what I believe. And Absalom in turn reminds him of his own things. Nonetheless, Absalom wants attention. And so in verse number 30, we find 
Notice here in verse 30, Therefore he said unto his servants, See, Joab's field is near mine, and he had barley there. Go and set it on fire. And Absalom's servants set, uh, set the field on fire. Who knows the financial loss that, that Joab suffered because of this. And this was done because he wanted something, and he was going to push and rob and kill just like he did with his brother to make sure that he got what he wanted. And so he burns down the fields of Joab so they can get Joab's attention. And the idea was, verse number 33, he said, I want to uh, see my father. Verse 33, so Joab came to the king and told him, and when he had called for Absalom, he came to the king and bowed himself on the face of the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. And I point that out because finally after how many ever years, Absalom is allowed to go back before his father, and the scripture says that he bows down before him. And that idea of bowing down is to show that there's a yield of the physical body's yield of because my spirit and soul is yielded. I'm yielded. I'm subjected to your authority as my, as my father. Chapter 14, verse number 25. Look, if you will. It says here, But in all Israel there was none to be so much praised as Absalom for his beauty, for the sole of his foot, even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. For when he pulled his head, for it was at every year's end that he pulled it. Pulled means to cut. Uh, it's another word for cutting the hair. Because his hair was heavy on him, therefore he pulled it. He weighed the hair of his head about 200 shekels after the king's weight. So that was about, I mentioned, four pounds of weight. So his hair got real heavy, and he cut it. He always wore his long hair. Had no body blemish. Scripture says there was room in no one in Israel that even compared to him. And he in turn lived out the part. It's kind of like that beauty act, man model. I can't think of his name. The name right now just escapes me. That I saw him. You remember seeing him as a kid? He had the long hair, and he would advertise perfumes and advertise. It's, it's escaping me. I heard him one day. Fabio. Fabio. I heard him one day talk. <laughs> that was funny. We have hear him talk. He kind of deceived his appearance. But anyway, he was like a Fabio, and that's how he appeared. He he just showed himself. He was beautiful. He knew this beautiful. He wanted. He had glorified himself. He wanted to be glorified and worshipped by other people. And I, I'm not going to get into another lesson about that. We know what the scripture says, First Corinthians chapter 11, about the whole issue of the hair. And I'll just divert away from that for the time being. Chapter 15, these first verses, Absalom now becomes very busy trying to steal the hearts of people. And you read verses 1 through 6. He sits outside the king's gate. Here he is in all of his beauty, his hair, his garments, you know, no physical blemish. And as people were coming in uh, to uh, see his father, he in turn acted as though he was candidating for a position. He acted as though that he was actually on the campaign trail to be the future king. And uh, he very, very, just very subtly undermined his father. Um, and he did this consistently over a period of some months, years, to the point that the Bible says that he stole the hearts of people. Look in verse number 13. And there came a messenger of David saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. Now this wasn't based on something that David had done or something that David had not done. This was based upon Absalom. Why would Absalom want to do that? What would be the reason behind that? He, he obviously had already, he's already doing everything he wants to do. He burns down the field of Joab. He in turn kills people, runs to other places. He begs to come back. He's forced people to allow him to come back. He comes back and in turn he lives. He has financially, he's totally paid for. He doesn't have to work. What, what, is that, what else does he want? And so he in turn... Uh, now spends his time undermining his father who has shown him mercy that he didn't deserve. Um, and is the reason that he has, you know, his heritage and his financial positioning and so forth. It wasn't because of his goodness. It was because of the family that he was born in. And yet he undermines his father. And the reason is because he wanted to be king of Israel. I believe that's why he killed Amnon, because he wanted to be king of Israel. Which is why he wouldn't subject to Joab, because he wanted to be king of Israel. And his play acting in front of his father, the bowing down, and so forth, was nothing more than hypocrisy. He in turn 
uh, desire to be key. It's my fault. Certainly, I leave it open for you to disagree. Verse 7 of chapter 15, And it came to pass after 40 years that Absalom said, and it said unto the king, I pray thee, let me go and pay my vow, which I have vowed unto the Lord in Hebron. Uh, for thy servant vowed a vow while I abode in Gersher, Gesher, in Syria, saying, The Lord shall bring me again and thee to, to Jerusalem, then I will serve the Lord. So this was a ploy or a plot, if you will. He was working out his military campaign so that he could uh, take over. He didn't really make a vow. He wasn't really serious about serving the Lord. The only person Absalom cares about is himself. And his actions prove that. And so all this is a lie. He's lying to his father. He's getting an excuse that he in turn can go out of town and put together his campaign or his plan. Uh, see from verse number 10, notice here. But Absalom sent spies throughout the, all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then you shall say, Absalom reigneth in Hebron. So he's going to go to Hebron, to Geshur. Geshur was a city in the, I guess you would say the county, like a county of Hebron. And he's going to go there and supposedly he's going to make good on a vow that he made to God. But the whole intent of it was so that he in turn could go there with people that were a little more separated from David. And that favored him a little bit more because that's where his family was from. His mother was from there. His father, uh, his, gra his grandfather was actually a king. His grandfather was actually the king of Geshur before in turn was dominated by Israel. And so he has heritage there, and, and he has undermined, you know, David there as well. And so he's going to begin there, and then from there advance back into Jerusalem and take over. And so Absalom rebels against his own father. David was in the position of authority over Absalom, and it was in that position for two reasons. One, he's his father, and two, he's the king. But all Absalom cared about was being his own king. He did not want anyone to rule over him, not David, and certainly not God. And this is the whole essence of rebellion. So Absalom's life at this point is just characterized over and over again. He's not going to follow rules. He's not going to submit you know, to authority. He is going to do what he feels that he wants to do. If, it, if he, in a passion that he wants, he's going to do what he wants. He's not going to follow due process. He's not going to subject himself to laws or the court system or to authority. He's going to do whatever he wants to do. And so this man, in turn, wanted in every way to be the king. And so we find that David flees from Absalom and he's pursuing chapters. And as best I can tell, this is the only time that David fled from an enemy. That's the only battle, if you will, that he lost. Uh, he flees from his son Absalom, and there's a reason for that. He, he certainly didn't want to fight his son. He didn't want his son to die. He certainly was accepting that maybe this is because of my rebellion from God in the times past. And, um, and so he flees from it. He crosses over the Jordan River, and he's over there. And um, in turn, he organizes his army there over the Jordan River for his own intent of protection. But Absalom, in turn, was not content with that. And so he organizes his men, crosses over the Jordan River to attack his father. And he was willing to do that. He was willing to kill his father so that he alone could be the king. So he finally could have the authority to do whatever he wanted to do, whenever he wanted to do it. But David, that wasn't David's case. David was willing to die for his son. And David's Absalom's death, chapter 18, if you look forward there, chapter 18, it gives us the story of his death. Verse number 9, it says, And Absalom met the servants of David, and Absalom rode on a mule, and the mule went under the thick boughs of a great oak, and his head caught hold on the oak, and he was taken up between the heavens. Um, Heaven and, heaven and earth, and the mule was taken under him, went away. And a certain man saw it and told Joab, and said, Behold, I saw Absalom hang in a oak. And Joab said unto the man that told him, Behold, thou sawest him, and thou didst not smite him there to the ground, and I would have given thee ten shekels of silver and a girdle. And so, literally, what happened was that he's riding on the mule, you know, and his hair is flying in the back. <laughs> 
and he's going underneath this oak tree, these, these uh, clusters of oak trees that have low branches, and his hair gets hung in an oak tree to the point that it grabs and the mule goes out from underneath him. And so now he's hanging from his hair uh, from this oak tree and still alive. And the men didn't kill him because the commandment of David and Joab came him back and he threw three darts to his heart and he killed him. And so Absalom in turn is now dead. The rebel was given a very shameful death. His glorious reign lasted days, perhaps weeks, and that was it. And David, he in turn sorrowed over the death of his son. Now I want you to turn one last passage and we'll finish Psalm chapter 3. I'm sure it's in your Bible, it should be. But the heading under Psalms 3, right below it, says this. A Psalm of David, when he fled from Absalom, his son. Now this psalm, or a song, was written by David as he expresses the trouble that he had because of Absalom's revolt. Absalom was proud, he was ambitious, but most importantly, he was rebellious. And he threw everything away in his life because he lusted after power and fame. Instead of being thankful, he had so much more than most. Perhaps he had more than all. But he wasn't thankful for his father, who was God. He wasn't thankful for his heritage. He wasn't thankful for the fact that he was a prince and could live a certain lifestyle. All that he could think of was, I don't want anybody to get in the way of me doing what I want to do. You see, rebellion is, is a very interesting disease. It's not about what you, it's not about the person doing one thing or the other. It's about the person doing what they want to do. Uh, I remember years ago, probably didn't handle this right, but I had a young man in our youth group. This is when I was a youth pastor. And he was growing to the Lord, doing great and so forth. But he, he was very rebellious. He didn't have a father's home, just a mother. And his mother was always having to negotiate with him to follow him. And yet he was saved and he wanted to, you know, he seemed to have some desire to do right. And, and he and I would have uh, some Bible studies and we would talk about some things. His name escapes me. I didn't have regular Bible studies, but I would have periodical Bible studies with him. And then he came to me and he said, Bro Stoniker, he said, I want to go soul with him. And I said, okay. I said, uh, that's fine. You can go soul with with me. We can go out and do one out together. But, but when you go, I want you to dress a little different than where you're dressing. Because he dressed like a gangster. And I said, I, I'm, not, I'm not judging you. But you're going to go to the door and I want you to understand you represent Christ. And, um, and so we go to the door. <coughs> We, we, we don't want to show the light that you used to live. We want to show the light you now live. And you know, he said, well, I like wrestling. I said, I understand. And I said, but you, you can witness other ways. You can talk to people. You can do other things. But if you're asking for you and I to go out and go door to door and hand out tracts and so forth, I'm just asking you because you represent Christ in the church that you dress a little differently than you dress it. And so he came so late at the time he showed up and he was dressed the same way that he always dressed. In fact, a little more distinctive in the game book. And I, Jordan, that was his name, I sat down and I said, what are you doing? And he said, this is how I want to dress. I said, I understand. I understand you do. But as I told you, if, you're gonna, if we're going to go and do this together, I'm asking you, please, if you'll be a little more respectful. Now, I perhaps could have, in my youth, I perhaps could have handled it differently, it's very true. But I don't know that I could have handled it in any way that it wouldn't reveal that there was rebellion in that child's heart. He, in turn, was going to do things the way he wanted to do. Rebellion is wicked. The Bible says it is as a sin of witchcraft. Literally, you, in turn, have given way to a medium of satanic, of satanic influences in your life. 
because the ultimate rebel is God, or not God, but is Satan. Satan rebelled against God in every way, in everything that he, whether it's his songs that he sings in rock. What is rock and roll about? It's about sex and drugs and rebellion. You can hardly sing a song about rebellion, or about rock and roll without somehow, you know, criticizing mom or dad or the government or whatever, because it's all about rebellion. Well, it's father of rebellion is Satan. So you have to think, I wonder where those lyrics are coming from. Who's influencing those? And so rebellion's wicked. Wicked. I had a little girl who was in our, our Christian school and she, she in turn, uh, we were on a trip. She was doing something she shouldn't do. And, and I set her down and I said, look, called her name. I said, look, I don't understand how you do things in your home. And I'm totally respectful. But I'm responsible for this activity, and we're not going to do that here. And I said, I'm just telling you, don't do that anymore. Do not do that. Are you clear? Do we understand it? Who was she upset? He's talking about plucking hell feathers, and she was upset. And she ran to her mother, and she was talking and had a little friends in the corner. And I called her later that day, as she in turn and snuck off and was doing the same thing that I told her again. And then again, and then again. And I just let her do it. And then when I got back to the church for activity, I pulled her parents in the office, and I pulled her in the office, and I said, you go ahead and take your daughter, and you can take her away from school. I said, works well. And I said, why? This would be cause. She in turn, I've asked her politely and kindly, and we addressed the issue, but she refuses to listen and follow. I'm not going to do it. I don't need any other rebellious people around this campus. If one person's rebellious, everybody in the school will be rebellious. And I said, well, you don't understand. She's been like that since she was a child. I said, I do understand. She was born with a heart of rebellion. Well, you don't understand that when she was little, the mother told me this. She said when she was little, we would tell her what to do and she wouldn't listen to us. And if she didn't get her way, she'd hold her breath. And we were afraid she'd pass out, so we just let her have what she wanted. You just got to learn how to talk to her. I said, I know how to talk to her. She's going to do things how I want them done in the school because I'm paying the bills. And I said, it's not difficult. So what you fail to understand is that she has rebellion that's steeped in her heart. That rebellion is steeped in her heart. And I in turn want nothing to do with it. And so don't call it something else. Call it what it is. It's rebellion. And she uh, went on and made a mess of her life. She, she really did. She, you know, just dishonored her parents and, you know, just got involved in terrible perversions and so forth. It was terrible, she said. And don't rejoice in any of that. But a person who lives in rebellion, in turn, is operating from a different spirit. And rebellion is always wrong. It's always wrong. Whether it's a wife, or a child, whether it's a husband, who won't leave, it's always wrong. We enter a father. It absolutely becomes such a good example of a man who had everything to be thankful for, but instead, all he can think of is, I want to be king. I want to be king. I want to be in charge of my own life. I want to do what I want to do. That's all you think. All right, let's have prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Daniel, can you dismiss this, buddy? Uh, that's what I'm going to try to do. It's been 40 years. Uh,